Good morning, everybody. My name is Alistair Reid, and I'm a new executive director of the Resolve Network and a senior expert for the program on violent extremism at the United States Institute of Peace. I'd like to welcome everyone to the fifth annual Resolve Network Global Forum and to say a bit about Resolve's work and introduce today's event. The Resolve Network is an international consortium of organizations and experts committed to better research, inform practice and improve policy on violent extremism. We provide key insights for establishing global connections and asking critical questions to enhance and inform work in this field. Our work spans thematic and geographic themes with projects focused on Sub-Saharan Africa, the Western Balkans, racially and ethnically motivated violent extremism and building expertise on violent extremist research. For more of our work and to get involved, please visit our website and follow us on Twitter. USIP is proud to house the Resolve Secretariat, made possible through partnerships with US Department of State, Bureau of Conflict and Stabilization Operations, the Global Engagement Center, and the US Agency for International Development. We would like to recognize and thank them for their consistent support, partnership, and commitment to Resolve, and for championing the importance of research and the growing evidence base for policies and programs. USIP's dedication to addressing violent extremism as a core peace and security challenge dovetails seamlessly with Resolve's objectives. Through Resolve's incredible network and research, research projects, frontline peace builders and policy audiences alike benefit from a deeper understanding and local nuance of the dynamics and complexity of violent extremism. I would like to offer a special thanks to Leanne Igbe Stedman, the director of USIP's program on violent extremism, who served as interim executive director of Resolve. Lan had ushered Resolve through its strategic development in the past three years and ensured seamless collaboration with USIP and the professional community working on preventing and countering violent extremism. This fifth annual forum is very different from all the previous ones. Instead of a day long conference, this year we've prepared a series of virtual discussions spread throughout the coming months. This is the first of those discussions, focusing on the place and role of violent extremism in 2020 and beyond. So please be on the lookout for upcoming events in the 2020 Resolve Forum series. Today's discussion is designed to be a collective reflection. 2020 ushered in rapid shifts in the global security landscape that altered the threat perceptions and global priorities. Amid threats from COVID-19 global public health crisis, climate change, and simmering conflicts, violent extremism remains a significant challenge for our global systems. Much research has been done on the past and current threats, but what are the emerging violent extremist threats percolating just below the surface today that will likely manifest themselves over the next few years ahead? Are there ways that policymakers and government officials can get ahead of that threat? Can we apply lessons from our experiences to address emerging threats and dynamics in the 2020 landscape? Today, we have three incredible experts who will give their insights and perspectives on the lessons learned and the challenges that lie ahead for countering violent extremism. Dr. Colin Clark is a senior research fellow at the Seafin Center and assistant teaching professor at Carnegie Mellon University. Dr. Clark will moderate today's discussion with Mary Beth Altia, and Amalnath Amalsing. Dr. Altia is a clinical associate professor at the Center for Global Affairs at New York University. Her recent work centers on the reasons why individuals support and participate in violent, especially terrorism, in developed and developing democracies. And is the author of an upcoming publication as part of Resolve's Violent Extremism, Disengagement and Reconciliation Project. Dr. Amalnath Amalsing is assistant professor in the School of Religion at Queen's University in Ontario, Canada. Its research interests are in radicalization, terrorism, diaspora politics, post-war reconstruction, and the sociology of religion. During today's event, we encourage you to ask questions to the speakers. You can submit your questions on the USIP events page where you're watching this webcast, on USIP's YouTube, or on Twitter using hashtag Resolve Forum. The session moderator will incorporate some of the questions into the broader conversation with the speakers. As a reminder, the event is on the record and will be available on USIP's YouTube afterwards. Thank you to all of you who have joined us today 
And don't forget to join us on Twitter at ResolveNet and at USOP with the hashtag ResolveForum. And with that, I would like to hang out, hand over to our moderator, Colin Clark. Thanks so much, Alistair. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be back with my friends and colleagues at the Resolve Network for the 2020 Global Forum on Violent Extremism in 2020 and beyond. I'd like to start by thanking the amazing team at Resolve for all their hard work in making the event happen. Uh, they're true professionals and, and just a pleasure to collaborate with. So uh, many thanks to everyone involved. Uh, 2020, where, where to begin? Um, what a year this has been. Uh, we're in a place where we're still continuing to deal with the aftermath of some of the major challenges we've faced over the past several years, uh, but we're also staring down an entirely new set of issues, even as we attempt to look beyond the horizon to identify and prepare for new forms of violent extremism and how those will manifest in the future. Resolve began five years ago, uh, right at the same time as the peak of the Islamic State, and in late 2020, where things stand today, the physical caliphate is in ruins, uh, although ISIS continues to rebuild its network throughout Iraq and Syria, uh, maintain a steady operational tempo of attacks, uh, and flush with enough cash to indefinitely wage a low-level campaign of sabotage, ambush, targeted assassinations, and terrorism for the foreseeable future. But even as the world might prepare to move on, it's not that simple. Thousands of fighters remain in prisons and detention camps, while tens of thousands of their family members languish in camps like Al Hol, vulnerable to further extremism and radicalization, and with few countries eager to repatriate their citizens. We're lucky to have experts with us here today that can speak to the importance of reintegration for promoting disengagement, the limits to reintegration in the current political context, and how the failure to reintegrate can fuel radicalization and recruitment throughout the world. We'll also have the opportunity to hear about some possible ways forward, including practical recommendations that government and government officials and policymakers might find helpful. A second theme we'll discuss throughout the forum is the COVID-19 pandemic, and specifically the second and third order effects of the pandemic that might not always be apparent or obvious, but which can be both insidious and corrosive in the short and the long term. COVID-19 has revealed an increasing lack of trust in expert systems, as well as a pervasive and growing sense of anime. Do the global consequences of COVID-19 provide a glimpse at what could happen with other global shifts in the future, uh, including climate change? And how will these shifts, with the potential for cascading effects the world is unprepared to handle, impact violent extremism and fuel new global trends that will destabilize countries and possibly entire regions? Lastly, we'll speak about the concept of cultural loss and how this concept is being manipulated by ideologues and extremists. The concept of white genocide and the need to protect Western civilization and values while promoting a white ethno state has fueled the global expansion of far right extremists including neo-Nazis and violent white supremacists. We've seen this across North America, Europe, Ukraine, and Australia. There is also the majority with a minority complex, especially prevalent throughout parts of Asia, given what we've witnessed in India, Myanmar, Sri Lanka, and China with its anti-Muslim violence and campaign to harass and imprison ethnic Uyghurs and Muslims in Xinjiang province. The common thread running throughout all these issues is the challenge posed by violent extremism, which is constantly changing and assuming new forms. These are hard problems, which is why we've chose to focus on them uh, at this year's Global Forum. And the research being conducted at the Resolve Network is uniquely positioned to help understand evolving trends and dynamics in the violent extremist landscape. Thank you so much for joining us today, and let's get started. I'm gonna open up the discussion with uh, a question for Amar. Um, and I alluded to this in my introductory remarks uh, about, you know, how things have changed over the last five years. Uh, we've all been working on this issue for a while, um, and to think back to where things were in 2015, uh, there, was, there was definitely a, a different sense of, uh, of panic almost in, into the Islamic State taking over large swaths of territory uh, in the Middle East. How has the threat posed by ISIS changed? Uh, to where we are today. What's the current situation in Iraq and Syria uh, in particular? Um, I know that, you know, you've been to the region and you've conducted field work uh, there, so you have a unique perspective that I think many people working on this issue, um, including many researchers, lack. So, so what's, your, what's your takeaway? 
Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's an ongoing uh, question, I think. I mean, if we just think back to how, uh, where we were, you know, just a few years ago, Mosul, uh, the kind of de facto uh, capital, if we can call it, of, of the Islamic State was taken back in July 2017. Raqqa, which was, um, you know, a massively important, uh, again, de facto capital of the Islamic State was taken back in October 2017. Um, and you had kind of the final villages uh, of Bagus and Ashrafa and all these other um, villages in, in the region taken back by uh, March 2019. But as I think a lot of research is starting to show, including a report from ICCT yesterday, uh, Iraq and Syria still remain uh, the main site of uh, attacks by the Islamic State. I mean, it, it, the, the numbers of attacks that we're seeing, sleeper cell activity that we're seeing is still um, very much uh, a kind of ongoing concern. Um, if, if you look at the Rojava Information Center's reports that they put out uh, quite regularly, um, they, they kind of note that the sleeper cell attacks have decreased in October, um, but the vast majority of those attacks, even as they go down, are happening in the province of Deir ez-Zor, um, and, and kind of sleeper cell raids are continuing to happen um, well into just last month, right? And so um, on the one hand, Syria and Iraq continue to be kind of the, the, the main concern uh, for continued activity of, uh, of sleeper cells in the Islamic State. Um, then there's the added issue uh, with the fall of Bagus in March 2019, a whole, all, everyone that came out of these final villages uh, were taken to a series of camps and prisons, as, as many people know, um, and they remain there, right? So all the men were taken to prisons in northeastern Syria, um, and all the women and children were taken to a series of camps uh, that some have closed now, but uh, many remain active. Um, and I think those two things, the kind of sleeper cell activity that we're seeing in Syria and Iraq, as well as the consequences of, of what's happening in these camps. And just to, I mean, just to talk about one camp in particular that everyone kind of um, recognizes, al Hol camp, um, as of last month, still contains 64,000 people. Um, and 53% of those are children, right? And, and this is one of the main things that you notice when you drive up to al Hol camp is that it's a sea of kids. It's, they're under every rock, they're on, beside every tent. It's just a sea of children, um, and all of them are under the age of 12. Um, and not about a thousand of these children are unaccompanied. They're, you know, they're not with their parents, and they're remaining in these uh, basically makeshift IDP camps uh, since since March 2019. Um, and so there have been, you know, 16 or so murders inside Al Hol camp. Um, there have been four COVID cases inside Al Hol camp. Um, there's chronic malnutrition, um, uh, violence almost daily. Um, and so it's a kind of untenable situation to keep these camps uh, active, particularly Al Hol camp. And so you have, um, I think both of those things are gonna um, stay with us well into next year and, and, and probably the year, year after. Yeah, thank you for your remarks. It's, uh, it's depressing to, to, to hear about it, but this is the reality that, that we're dealing with. Uh, this week, the, the Sufan Center held its uh, Global Security Forum, and we were lucky to have Ambassador Nathan Sales from the State Department um, Counterterrorism Bureau uh, give, give some remarks to, to Peter Bergen in a, in a fireside chat. And Ambassador Sales spoke at length uh, about the situation and, and almost used the same words as you. It's an untenable situation. Um, and he spoke about the importance of, of repatriation. I'm wondering if Mary Beth um, can you talk to us about the importance of reintegration for promoting disengagement um, and relatedly what some of the limits to reintegration might be? Sure, Colin. So first of all, thank you to the Resolve Network for having me here. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, when I look at where we are with ISIS now, what I see um, is very emblematic of what we've seen repeatedly in the so-called war on terror. And that is that, you know, we're really very good at achieving these clear military victories, but we're very poor at planning for what comes after. And I think that's really evident in the camps. So you have the destruction, right? We have the military victory and the destruction of ISIS's physical caliphate, but we have the ideology and the members live, uh, living on. And as Amara mentioned, right, we have over 64,000 people just um, in, in one camp. So um, I have been working with the Resolve Network and USIP. I've been very fortunate to work with them uh, to think about how we promote the disengagement and reintegration of those, those individuals. And I do have, as Alistair mentioned, a report coming forward uh, that draws primarily on the DDR literature uh, to think about how we can best facilitate their, their reintegration. And by, by DDR, I mean the disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration literature. 
So for a long time, if you look at how governments ap approach uh, repatriation and reintegration, they're very focused on individuals, right? What is the risk that this individual poses? We shouldn't bring these individuals back because they might you know, launch an attack. Uh, and they're not really clear on how to best facilitate their disengagement and reintegration, because if they were, then it wouldn't be such a security risk to bring them back. So what can we learn from, from the DDR literature, which takes this sort of whole of society approach? I'm just going to highlight some of the, the highline findings here, and I would encourage you to read the whole report um, when it comes out. It's quite lengthy, but I think there's a lot of information there that, that we can use to help us promote the disengagement and reintegration of those individuals. So first, in terms of thinking why it's important to reintegrate these individuals and not detain them in camps, the DDR literature shows quite conclusively that when ex-combatants are detained for a long period of time uh, post-conflict, particularly in inhumane conditions, uh, and as Amar described the camps, they're very um, inhumane and insecure, uh, that that feeds a discourse of resistance against the state uh, and that these individuals are more likely to join armed groups when they leave. They're less likely to you know, see the legitimacy of the state or whichever external actors are holding them or detaining them. So that's one problem right there. These camps, obviously, and I think it's pretty intuitive, are probably having a radicalizing effect, even for individuals who maybe weren't committed to the ideology to, be, to begin with. Uh, the second issue that, that's highlighted in the DDR literature is that the longer that you detain individuals, the more likely that the community is, or sorry, the less likely the community is to accept them. So um, it stigmatizes them, right? So these are ISIS, um, former ISIS fighters, they're um, you know, ISIS supporters. Um, and so, so what you see is that you know, it, it really impedes their acceptance by the community. It also makes it harder for them to see themselves in a pro-social role. So the longer they're detained, the more difficult it is for them to see alternatives for themselves outside of their involvement in terrorism or their support in terrorism. Uh, and this is really important because a lot of the research that I've done and in interviews with uh, former violent extremists show that many of them are deeply disillusioned with their involvement in terrorism. And when we look, look at ISIS, and I'll perhaps talk about this a little bit later, you know, many of them were coerced into support or involvement. So you, know, you have to imagine there are individuals there who are deeply disillusioned and who are looking for a way out. And if they don't see any alternatives, if their time in detention isn't contributing to the reintegration. So you could imagine you could be detained in humane conditions, perhaps learning a skill set. Um, you know, that provides you some alternatives, um, you know, or, or some, some sense of alternatives uh, when you are released from that camp. Uh, and this isn't to say that individuals shouldn't be prosecuted. Absolutely, individuals you know, who've committed crimes should be prosecuted. But when we think about the reintegration of those individuals we can't prosecute um, or who have not committed crimes. The third thing I will say is that detaining these individuals in camps, and I've seen this firsthand, um, and not releasing them for so long, and not repatriate that, repatriating them, uh, feeds, I think, radicalization and recruitment in the West. So about a year and a half ago, I was in the UK, and I was speaking with um, you know, a uh, Islamist activist, and he kept saying, well, you know, um, the failure to repatriate these Muslims just shows that we're second class British citizens or we're not considered British citizens. And you can imagine them going around and using this to, to radicalize and recruit um, to their cause. And then the last thing that I'll say that's, that's highlighted in the report, um, the Resolve report, is that we need to think seriously about the economic, political, and societal situation into which these individuals are reintegrating. So. Again, a lot of the existing literature, especially recently on disengagement um, and recidivism, focuses on individuals, their motivations for involvement, um, and, and things like that. But you know, we don't really think seriously about you know, what are these individuals reintegrating into. So if they want to have, you know, what, one of the ways in which you can foster the development of pro-social ties is through employment, right? But in some places, if we think about Somalia, for instance, there aren't really a lot of economic opportunities for individuals or conflict disrupts the economy continuously. So it's really hard for individuals to obtain um, sustainable livelihoods. The DDR literature also shows that individuals for, for reintegration to be sustainable and disengagement long-term, this requires a certain level of security, mutual trust and political will in society. So individuals need to feel safe, right? If they're reintegrating into Syria and they don't feel safe, they may seek out armed groups to protect themselves. Uh, same thing with mutual trust, right? When I think about the Sunni-Shia divide in Iraq, for instance, there's not mutual trust between these, these groups, right? And so they may have you know, incentives 
to uh, return to an armed group or to support an armed group. And so I'm not really optimistic. Um, you know, when I look at the situation right now in Syria and Iraq, um, you know, sure, we definitely can absolutely reintegrate individuals. You know, certain individuals may reintegrate, but just thinking long term, if we're, we're still in the same place politically, um, there are these incentives for individuals to go back to violent extremism or armed groups. Um, and even if they don't go back in, let's say, 10, 15 years, you know, the incentives are still there for their children. So the DDR literature shows quite clearly when these certain political conditions are in place that we are likely to see uh, rearmament long term. Um, and when I look at Syria, for instance, right, I mean, Assad is still in power. Uh, the grievances that, you know, led to the rise of al-Nusra in part um, and ISIS are still there. Uh, same thing with Iraq. We have Iranian-backed Shia militias. If I was a Sunni in Iraq, um, you know, I would be concerned about my security. And there's definitely not mutual trust. So, um, and there's also stigma. So if we look at the reintegration of these individuals into Europe, for instance, they face a certain level of stigma that can actually preclude uh, their reintegration into society, their political reintegration and their social reintegration. And so there are questions, maybe I'll talk more about it later, about how we combat um, that stigma. And just one more thing I'll add is that I have um, a paper and, and the stigma is very real. So um, I have a paper that's a working paper and it, it basically shows that if we look at support in the United States using experimental research uh, for prisoner reentry programs, uh, if an individual is convicted of murder in support of a criminal group, uh, support for prison, prisoner reentry is much higher than if that individual is convicted of support or, or convicted of murder in support of a terrorist group. And then if you just look at terrorist offenders, um, support for prisoner reentry programming is much higher for far right terrorism offenders than for uh, Muslim or Islamist terrorism offenders. So there is a clear uh, stigma there. Wow, that's some fascinating research, both the um, forthcoming resolve paper as well as the working paper. Um, and, and I think, you know, those on this call right now uh, would learn a lot, including myself. Um, and, and I think a really great breakdown of um, a difficult topic, which is going into the DDR literature and pulling out, um, you know, kind of best practices and lessons learned. Uh, you know, much of it, when you hear it, seems like common sense, right? The longer someone is detained, the more stigma will be attached, the more they begin to see themselves um, as, um, you know, not being able to, to, to be salvaged. So, um, you know, I think it was Ali Soufan who, who said, when you take some, you know, when you make someone stateless, you're giving them one option and that's to become a citizen of the Islamic State. And I, and I think about that um, quite often, but much of what you talked about, uh, including the, the political will and the political context, particularly in Europe right now, uh, I think is, is highly interesting. And my sense is that COVID-19 is going to actually make it more difficult to, um, to, to move folks back to their countries of origin. Um, I want to stay on the Islamic State um, for now. And uh, Amar, can you give us a, a brief overview of what you see as the future of ISIS? I mean, are we going to be having this same conversation five years from now? Um, yeah, I, 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 I think so. <laughs> I think what we're seeing now um, is, you know, as you know, kind of increased attacks that we've seen in Afghanistan and the Afpak region, um, a kind of real scaling up of attacks in parts of West Africa, uh, Mali, Burkina Faso, uh, Niger, and so on. Um, not, and it's not just the Islamic State, but a variety of kind of uh, jihadist groups that are active in the region. Um, we, we saw Mozambique uh, just a few weeks ago or a week ago, you know, uh, there's a beheading of 50 people. Uh, in the country. Um, and, and what I think is common in, in a lot of these different regions um, is that local grievances um, and, and kind of local movements that existed are either at willfully attaching themselves to these kind of more international brands, if you will, like Al Qaeda or the Islamic State, um, or, and, and, or ISIS itself is, is um, seeing kind of avenues for recruitment on the ground by um, addressing some of these local grievances like lack of economic opportunities, um, consequences of climate change that uh, arise from things like food shortages and so on. Um, and so these larger organizations, international organizations, are making inroads into some of these more local grievances and local conflicts that are much older um, by tapping into some of these, um, tapping into some of these local grievances. Um, the other thing that's important um, is, of course, what's happening in the West and what's happening in the online space. We've seen attacks in Vienna, France, the UK um, over the last little while. Um, we know that 
uh, ISIS in particular was kicked off of uh, their kind of prime tele, you know, uh, application of Telegram in, in, in November 2019. Um, and they're kind of moving into different, uh, different platforms as, as they go. But I think um, there is the kind of uh, what we can call a caliphate nostalgia, I guess, by some of these uh, supporters who are looking to this kind of state that existed um, as, as a kind of you know, prime motivation and prime inspiration for a lot of their current activity and current um, propaganda. And so that is not going to go away just because you take away property or, or you take away land uh, in Mosul and Raqqa. Um, and so a lot of that kind of uh, momentum, I think, all of the propaganda momentum that was built up over the last five years um, is something we're going to have to contend with going forward. And we've already seen some young people in, in Canada and the US and elsewhere um, be inspired by this content. And they're not doing anything at the moment, but it's, it's still uh, something that's part of what they're reading and consuming and so on. We had one case in Canada um, just fairly recently try to go to Syria and join the Islamic State well after uh, the entire border region between Turkey and Syria was taken back. Um, and so I, I don't know where he thought he was going, um, but he, but he, you know, he would have been picked up by the Kurds pretty quickly. But you, you see that the ability to kind of inspire uh, is, is still very much part of the ISIS um, uh, repertoire. And so I think that we're, we're not going to be, you know, not talking about this in, in a little while, I think. Yeah, some really interesting points. I think, you know, the, um, the willingness now of ISIS core to consider groups in sub-Saharan Africa, where maybe several years ago, um, you know, there was less of a need because um, the caliphate was uh, perceived as more successful. Now there's this outreach um, and, and you see these local groups acting in almost a parasitic manner of kind of uh, glomming on to, uh, to, the, to the Islamic State. You mentioned Mozambique. Um, I, I think also the, the concept of caliphate nostalgia. Um, in fact, a few years ago, myself and Herrera Ingram wrote a piece um, on that exact topic. We called it the nostalgia narrative uh, and speculated, how is this going to play out, particularly in Europe? Um, you know, if you are a nine-year-old, uh, you know, whose older brother went and fought and died in Iraq and Syria, you then become a teenager. How are you treated in, in your neighborhood in London, Brussels, Paris? Does that give you kind of street cred, as it were? Um, and does that kind of then encourage other people to continue um, with, a, you know, the propaganda momentum? That's a, that's a really, I think, um, apt way to characterize uh, what, what we've seen with the Islamic State. Uh, Mary Beth, we've had a fairly depressing conversation, um, I think, up until now. Can you offer us some hope? What are, what are some possible ways forward? Um, even a glimmer, I would accept. <laughs> yeah, so I'm probably not the best person for this question because I'm, I'm pretty uh, pessimistic about, you know, the future, like Amar, um, you know, especially given the political circumstances. We have a proliferation of fragile states and things like that. So, um, but what I will say is, and, and what I often tell my students, uh, when we look at ISIS, um, you know, at least during the period of the insurgency, a lot of their supporters were coerced or intimidated. So I do see that that larger support base as, as very shallow when compared with, um, you know, other groups. So I think, you know, if we do focus on, you know, facilitating the reintegration of those individuals, I think it's very possible. I don't think many of them wanted to join ISIS to begin with or wanted to support ISIS to begin with. Um, you know, if someone's holding a gun to your head and says, join ISIS or die, you know, I probably would join ISIS. So um, I think, you know, and this isn't to say a lot of former violent extremists I've spoke with, you know, they'll still continue to spew the ideology because that's what they're taught. And maybe in the camps, they're protecting themselves from the group. So I think there are individuals who are deeply disillusioned, do not want to be involved and are looking for a way out. So um, how do we facilitate that, you know, given, as I mentioned earlier, the kind of dire political context in Syria and Iraq. So um, one of the sort of glimmers of hope in the DDR literature is the promotion of community-based projects, um, which, you know, in that region would be really important, especially post-conflict, where individuals can, you know, work with communities um, on a project that, you know, shows their commitment to a shared future, uh, helps combat uh, the stigma that exists in the community shows that they can be pro-social, gives them a sense that they can um, be pro-social. So that's sort of where I see the, the glimmer of hope. Good. Let's hope that, you know, some, some governments, um, you know, consider this, you know, very practical policy advice, um, because I think if, if, if they don't and if there's not um, 
some kind of political will mustered, we will be back here in five years having this exact same conversation. Uh, I'd like to switch gears here just a little bit and, and talk about COVID-19 and how you both think it will or, or maybe won't impact uh, the changing nature of, of violent extremism. And I'll start with Amar. Uh, and I'd like you to address the question of what it means to have, uh, we've seen a widespread loss of trust in, in expert systems. Certainly we've seen that in the United States uh, and, there, and there's a number of reasons why, but I think that's been a worldwide phenomenon. Um, relatedly, it, it feels like there's a growing sense uh, of enemy. Uh, can you speak a little to, to both of these issues? Sure, yeah. I, I mean, just in the interest of time, I won't get uh, too crazy, but I think, um, you, you know, there's been a lot of literature uh, going back 30, 40 years looking at um, the consequences of what they call late modernity, right? And so this is, this is where uh, the risks that we experience are largely um, unidentified. You kind of need science to work on its full capacity to even know that climate change is happening, for example. Um, the, 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 these risks tend to be kind of uh, transnational or universal, you know, um, forest fires in California cause ash to fall in Vancouver. And so you're not really protected by um, uh, national boundaries as, uh, as was in the past. Um, and these risks are largely kind of ir irreversible, right? And so vaccines are a good example. Uh, GMO foods that people used to be concerned about and still concerned about are, are another example that once it's out there, you can't really call it back uh, if it starts to cause harm and so on. And so, you know, just to quote Donald Rumsfeld, I guess the, 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 the late modernity means that late, the unknown unknowns are um, quite plenty. And what this often leads to is a requirement that we have increased trust in these very expert systems, um, medicine, science, uh, social science, um, and, and, and public health and so on. Um, to solve and kind of make us feel better, make us feel like uh, somebody at least is taking care of um, these this kind of increased risks that we see. Um, but what happens when there are these kind of flashpoints uh, like COVID-19 is that the, the trust in those expert systems is questioned, is, is kind of thrown, uh, thrown in, into flux. Um, and so it, it's this kind of catch-22 that people talk about where just when we need increased trust in these systems to survive these major uh, moments in history like pandemics, it's also the time when trust gets eroded, right? And, and uh, just in Canada, for example, we saw one of these, uh, you know, in, in terms of violent extremism, we saw one uh, case of uh, a ma man named Corey Huron basically drive uh, his truck through the gates of Rideau Hall. Um, before he had done that, he uh, posted about what, what was known as Event 201, which is a kind of um, pandemic response uh, exercise that was done before COVID. And so obviously it's made its way into conspiratorial uh, literature quite heavily. Um, he wrote a kind of, I don't want to call it a manifesto, but he wrote a letter uh, basically talking about, you know, his great financial distress, that he worried his truck was going to be repossessed, um, that Canada, because of its COVID response, is turning into a kind of communist dictatorship, um, that he felt he was under house arrest, that his world was falling apart. Um, and I think um, this is this is the consequences that we're going to see going forward, right? Is, and, and there's been a lot of um, people talking about, uh, you know, uh, increased pressure on public health officials to address increased anxiety and things like that. Um, and, and, and so I think we forget how much kind of these institutions and normalcy um, help root us in our communities, help root us in our families. Um, just very simple things like where are your kids going to go in the morning is now up in the air, right? Is now something you have to negotiate and, 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 and think about. Um, and so these kind of taken for granted aspects of your life, the kind of wallpaper of our lives that make us feel like we're part of something that we're, that we're rooted somewhere, um, the pandemic, things like the pandemic come and throw that uh, for a loop. Um, some people thrive in that environment, you know, they, they pick up the piano or they learn another language or something, but I think for a lot of people, uh, it's deeply disorienting um, and, and can cause um, a, a lot of consequences, right? And so I don't think it's a surprise that we saw a kind of huge spike in conspiratorial thinking, a huge spike in conspiracy activity uh, right around the lockdown period uh, related to COVID, but related to anti-mask movements, related to QAnon um, and a whole host of other fringe kind of ideas. Um, because I think the pandemic came and said, everything that you thought was uh, fixed and normal and um, moving at, at, at kind of at moving in cruise control is now up in the air and up in, up in flux. And so people kind of react in very um, harmful ways sometimes. A lot of time it's self-harm, but 
um, as we've seen in some instances, it can be pointed outwards as well. Uh, thank you. There's a lot there to unpack. I mean, uh, I completely agree with the, the deeply disorienting nature of, of COVID-19. I mean, <clears throat> I think if we were to be honest, everybody's experienced that feeling over the, the past several months. Um, even those who are well equipped to deal with it, you know, financially, emotionally, it's taken a toll on, on everyone. Um, needless to say, the most vulnerable among us um, have been impacted to, to a greater degree. Uh, the rise in conspiracy theories and, and its um, you know, overlap with uh, real world political or ideologically motivated violence, I think is gonna be uh, something that's with us for, for quite some time. Um, and I think a lot of this for me uh, reminds me how fragile society can, can be, um, how we're you know, kind of always teetering on the brink there. And, and when you have an event of this magnitude, it could, it could really tip us into a, a bad place. I'd also just like to say, I, I appreciate this, that this event is being recorded um, because we now have you on record as quoting Donald Rumsfeld um, in a talk. So that's something that I'll, I'll never forget. I appreciate that. Um, Mary Beth, can I, <clears throat> getting back to, to, to the discussion, can you talk a little bit about the impact on state capacity that, that COVID's had? And we know that's kind of dovetailed. Uh, it's really kind of hit state capacity at the same time that inequality has been exacerbated. Um, how, how does that kind of come together to contribute to a rise in, in violent extremism? Yeah, sure. Uh, so when we think about the second or the potential second and third order effects of COVID, uh, one of the things that we've seen is that the pandemic has disproportionately affected uh, the working class uh, as well as minorities. So um, this can contribute to, we've already had growing inequality um, in, in developed democracies especially, uh, but I think that COVID will exacerbate that uh, as well as, as rising in, uh, unemployment. And so we know uh, that ideologies, these sometimes these extreme ideologies, I often think about Robert Bowers, right? It helps them make sense of a, a, a personal crisis, helps individuals make sense of a personal crisis as well as a societal crisis. And so, um, you know, when you think about growing inequality and unemployment and sort of the larger effects of COVID, uh, individuals are experiencing personal crises, as Amar mentioned, and there's a clear societal crisis. So um, we can't say for sure yet, but these ideologies might, might resonate more. Um, and so we might see that contribute to violent extremism. With regard to state capacity, I mean, it's, it's pretty obvious, but you know, states are gonna have to divert resources to deal with the pandemic. So I would expect fragile states, and we already have a proliferation of those to become more fragile. So this will make it easier for violent extremists to operate. Uh, it also opens up opportunities for uh, violent extremist groups to uh, engage in what we call rebel governance or the provision of services. So. Um, if you remember after the pandemic, there was all this discussion about Hezbollah, you know, um, uh, issuing go, uh, guidance about COVID, having mobile hospital units. I saw pictures of them spraying down the streets, the Taliban, ISIS as well. Um, and I think, you know, so there's discussion that this could help generate support or at least, you know, favorable feelings towards these groups. Um, but I do think that we need to also keep in mind that it actually sometimes this need to um, provide these services can become a burden for these groups. So. Um, if you look at a group like ISIS, it's very wealthy for a violent extremist group, but it's very poor for a state. Um, and so I just know from my own research on Northern Ireland in particular that, you know, providing these services is something that these groups sometimes don't want to do. It's demanded by the population. So it's not always a win-win for them. I don't know how it's gonna suss out. Um, and then the final thing I'll say is that, you know, we have seen increasing authoritarianism. And I do think that we are seeing states you know, sometimes very innocently expand their powers in the interest of public health, um, but also exploits uh, the pandemic to increase surveillance measures. Uh, we saw this with Hungary, with China. And I guess my worry is that even if that's done very innocently, that these things could become sticky um, and, and be part of this larger trend towards authoritarianism. So even if we look at, you know, um, United States policy post 9-11 with the, the Patriot Act, the AUMF, I mean, these things are still, you know, they stick, they stay around. So. Um, so I worry about those effects as well. And we know that, you know, these authoritarian uh, policies can, you know, uh, create grievances and radicalize individuals. Absolutely. Um, the, the, I'll start with your last comment first, which is the increased surveillance uh, in the name of protecting public health and the concern that that becomes uh, the new normal and a new way of life, right? This is the kind of creeping measures of the slippery slope. Uh, I still remember having this conversation with Aaron Zellin. Uh, it must have been over a year and a half ago, not 
COVID related, but this, um, you know, the Trojan horse of technology, right? And we were talking about China specifically, but then, you know, discussing also how th that model could be attractive to a number of other countries, certainly authoritarian countries, but even countries, you know, that, that we didn't, we don't necessarily consider authoritarian, right? Because if, if you're, if, if you're sold on this helps with your, with your terrorism problem, uh, we've seen what lengths uh, countries are willing to go to, including our own, um, to, uh, to at least mitigate the, uh, the opportunities for terrorist groups to conduct strikes. Uh, you, you mentioned ISIS being a wealthy for a terrorist group and poor for a state, and that, that really resonates because in my own research on ISIS financing, I think we focus so much on the group's credits, we focus very little on the debits, right? So when you have money going out the door, to sustain that state, uh, that's something too. Uh, and, and then you also mentioned Robert Bowers, uh, and that hits home for me personally, um, because I was uh, living in Squirrel Hill, the neighborhood where the Tree of Life attack uh, occurred. Uh, when that happened, I had uh, lived in Squirrel Hill for 10 years. And so I, I you know, I've, I've followed his case very closely um, and, and, you know, living in Pittsburgh now and somebody that was, uh, he was raised out here and, and uh, how did this individual radicalize and how many more people like him are also out there harboring these grievances. Uh, and that leads me to the question of, um, you know, when you have these pre-existing conditions or grievances, as it were, layered on top of COVID-19, uh, can, can you guys talk to a little bit about how COVID-19, what impact has it had on racially and ethnically motivated violent extremism? Uh, we'll start with Amar and, and then we'll go to Sure, yeah, no, it's a good question. I think, um... I mean, immigrants and refugees are always coded as security threats or health threats or financial threats long before COVID, right? I mean, we had uh, Tamil refugees arrive in Canada on boat a few, uh, 10 years ago, and even mainstream media was asking things like, are they bringing tuberculosis to Canada? Are they, you know, are, are, they, are they terrorists? Are they this and that? So I think that, that kind of looking at immigrants um, through a kind of securitized lens is, 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 is very much uh, part and parcel of what we do here. <laughs> but what's happening more and more now is, of course, uh, you have uh, far right political parties like the AFD in Germany and, and uh, others who are uh, using COVID as a kind of I told you so moment, right? And they're pointing to COVID to say, hey, look, you know, we warned you about immigrants, we warned you about um, the kind of diseases that they're going to bring, et cetera. And, and I think that um, is feeding into uh, some of their own propaganda. I think what I'm worried about, though, even uh, more casually, um, is is whether COVID, you know, COVID is kind of tilling the soil, even amongst the quiet people, uh, that 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 will allow later anti-immigrant arguments to resonate a bit more, right? And so, um, if they hear anti-immigrant arguments from political parties uh, later on, um, have they have they been primed through COVID to kind of um, listen to those messages more than than would have been in the past? And so I think. Um, the, the kind of impact on anti-immigrant sentiment, I think, is going to be uh, less obvious than we might, might imagine. It's not going to be crazy far-right people yelling about it on the streets, even though that'll happen. But I think the long-term impact might be that um, how did it kind of till the soil for uh, anti-immigrant sentiment going forward? But I think uh, that, that still remains to kind of be studied. Absolutely. Mary Beth, do you want to weigh in on this, the same question? What impact uh, COVID-19 has had on racially and ethnically motivated violent extremism? Sure. Um, I think it's very hard to say anything for sure right now um, in terms of the impact that it's had. Um, you know, I think when I look at rising re uh, racially and ethnically motivated violence, I see it as part of this longer trend of, you know, a backlash to globalization, rising populism, increasing authoritarianism. So, um, you know, COVID is definitely probably exacerbating that. Um, but it's really hard to say for sure that it, it, it is having, you know, um, an impact. So I, you know, sometimes when I, my social science brain turns on, you know, I think at night, like I think, well, if COVID wasn't here, would the rise in racially and ethnically motivated violence be the same, right? We have had this increasing trend and maybe, you know, to Amar's point, maybe there'd be other grievances that these groups would be, um, you know, drawing on uh, to motivate people. So we've talked a lot um, you know, just in the scholarly community about side switchers. And so I just wonder, you know, if individuals, you know, if it wasn't COVID or the shutdowns, if it would have been the migrant caravans, right? We don't hear about those anymore. So, um, so it's just really hard for me to say anything definitively. I mean, it's probably exacerbating things, but, you know, it's just hard to get data to say for sure. 
Yeah, I think that's one of the challenges, right? As social scientists, we're always looking to uh, measure, evaluate, assess, and, and we need the data to do that. And, and frankly, it, you're right, it's still too early to make any kind of uh, definitive, uh, draw any definitive conclusions there. I always see a lag effect with these types of things, right? So what's happening right now, what's percolating under the surface will manifest two, three, four years from now. It will then appear obvious, ah, of course, you know, there was a huge boost in um, recruiting for far right extremists because everybody was at home, everybody was online, right? Everybody was, um, you know, uh, stressed out and looking for explanations to help them understand how we got here, right? How did we get to this situation? Oh, it was, you know, immigrants, it was this cabal of elites, whatever, um, you know, helps people kind of deal with their own worldview or reality. And, and I think. We are likely to see that uh, in, in our um, global security forum earlier this week, uh, EU counterterrorism coordinator Gilles de Kirchhoff called COVID-19 an accelerant, right? He said, you know, there were the, as you mentioned, Mary Beth, there was these trends that were already kind of moving in one direction, and this probably accelerates those um, even, even further ahead. And then I think, Amar, your point on kind of how even political parties have really been trying to seize uh, COVID-19 and use it as an opportunity. You mentioned the AFD uh, in, in Germany, and I'll, I'll just use that as a, an opportunity to plug uh, my Resolve paper with uh, co-authored with Jason Blazakis. Uh, it's called From, uh, Par From Paramilitaries to Parliamentarians, uh, Disaggregating the Global Far Right. And we're going to be looking at this kind of uh, global landscape uh, and how there's this interplay or the spectrum between um, far right political parties all the way down to kind of Street level, street level movements um, and, and beyond. Uh, I, I think the focus on the far right and whatever you call it, you know, rim V, rim T, um, it leads us to this concept of cultural loss, right? So white supremacists have focused on um, this notion of a white genocide, uh, of the Islamization of Europe, um, and have really tried to offer this grievance fueled narrative uh, that at least seems to be resonating with supporters and new recruits. Um, I, I wanna kind of talk about this in terms of countering violent extremism and CVE, um, which, you know, from my purview, the last 20 years of the global war on terrorism, that's always meant jihadis, right? Even when it was occurring in, in other kind of uh, realms, to me, the, what I saw, the lion's share meant, how are we going to um, deal with this threat of, uh, you know, primarily Sunni inspired terrorism? Now we're left with, you know, uh, race, racially and ethnically motivated violence. Uh, in terms of CVE, are we prepared to deal with current and future RUMV threats? Um, and can we get better at anticipating threats before they metastasize? Um, Mary Beth, I'd like to start with you on that. So um, in terms of anticipating threats before they metastasize, I think you know, I think we tend to be, as you mentioned, Colin, we tend to be reactive rather than proactive. So I think a lot of that is driven as, as researchers and, and potentially maybe CBF, CBE practitioners. I think a lot of that is driven by, um, by funding, by media demand for commentary on certain things. So I think, um, you know, if, if research, researchers could think a little bit more independently about, you know, not where we are now, but, you know, what's on the horizon drawing on on theory. Um, so for me, when I'm trying to make sense of, of the world, I find going back to those, those good old theories of, of terrorism studies, so like Martha Crenshaw, Paul Wilkinson, I find that those things are actually much more helpful um, than granular analysis. So obviously you need empirical evidence, um, but that's sort of where I see, you know, or just the time. I know certain government agencies do, do provide the time to think about these sort of long-term trends and threats, and I think it's absolutely critical um, you know, to be focused or to have the time and, and the resources to focus on those things so we don't uh, miss them. In terms of cultural loss, um, I know Amar is going to speak a little bit uh, about that, but I think uh, when I look at cultural loss and, and the rise of, of Remedy, you know, we do see it as this sort of, you know, back, as I mentioned earlier, this backlash to globalization, um, to uh, the loss of, you know, white privilege in society. Um, but I also see cultural loss when I look at other terrorist groups or violent extremist groups. So I'm absolutely not an expert on the Middle East. If anyone, if anyone is, please correct me. But my understanding there, right, is that we did have this 
that the rise of Islamism was this backlash to secularism, right? This idea of cultural loss in region, Western intervention. Um, when I look at groups in Northern Ireland, so royalist paramilitaries, there wasn't so much about cultural loss, but the loss of one's privileged status within the political system, which is what I think we see a lot of REMV um, or far-right terrorism uh, embodying, so. Thank you, yeah, I mean, you, you, you covered a lot of ground there, and I think you're right to absolutely pull in um, outside groups, right? Groups in the Middle East, groups in Europe, uh, because, you, you know, I've noticed maybe in the last year as there's been uh, more of a focus on REMV, REMT, uh, again, you know, different terms, depending on what government agency you talk to, what part of the world um, you end up operating in. But I, for, for Amar, and, and this will be my last question before we open to the audience, I want to focus on the E in REMV, um, which is ethnic, right? Uh, can you talk to us about what the majority with a minority complex is and, and what the consequences are? And, and I believe we've seen this mo most poignantly um, throughout parts of Asia. So Sri Lanka, Myanmar, um, and elsewhere. Can, can you talk a little bit to that? Sure, yeah. I mean, I, I, going back to what Mary Beth was saying, I, I mean, this is a, largely a response, particularly in the current period, to globalization and kind of a transnational awareness of what's happening abroad, right? And so it, it feeds into a lot of the propaganda um, in a lot of these countries. And it has to be said, anti-Muslim propaganda specifically um, that feeds into a lot of these countries um, that, that kind of arises from what uh, Stanley Tambea, with a, with a focus on Sri Lanka, called the majority with the minority complex. It's this idea that even though you're the majority in the country, you're the ethnic, religious, cultural majority in the country, um, there's something about your place in that majority, your place in that society that is, is making you, is turning that identity, which should be fairly comfortable, uh, into an embattled one, right? It, it, the, the sense that you have a minority complex, that you always feel like you have to um, continuously stake your claim uh, as the majority, you have to pass policies that are majoritarian, that you have to keep minorities under your thumb, that uh, minorities, particularly Muslims in a lot of these countries that we're talking about, are this kind of sinister fifth column who are um, secretly plotting to take over, secretly plotting to become the majority, um, secretly plotting uh, attacks against the majority, and, and, and so this fuels a lot of these policies that we're seeing you know, the Hindutva movement in India, um, the, the treatment of Uyghurs in China, the, the, the treatment of the Tamil community and the Muslim community in Sri Lanka, the treatment of the Rohingya in, in Myanmar, um, and a lot of the kind of white nationalist arguments as well, as you mentioned, white genocide, um, uh, the, this kind of sense of white civil rights uh, that, that, that popped up a bit in the US uh, under Charlottesville and so on. Um, this idea that you know we're the in-group, a kind of increased attachment to the in-group, uh, the in-group is being eroded, um, and that we need to do something to um, rejuvenate, make people proud of that identity, um, and then fight back against whatever threat uh, is, is, is um, they seem to be uh, pointing to. Um, and, and, and so a lot of the, if you if you look at a lot of the propaganda across these kind of diverse countries, it's remarkably similar, right? And and there was some, uh, a lot of this circulated on Facebook and Twitter a while back uh, in, in with, with respect to India and Sri Lanka and Myanmar in particular, that uh, Muslims are, you know, are, are plotting to have a lot of children, that they're using uh, sterilization tactics against the majority to keep that population down, um, that uh, they're plotting attacks and so on. And so the, the propaganda bizarrely from Myanmar, Sri Lanka, China, India, Western Europe actually talked about very similar things throughout. And, and so um, this is why I think that this sense of kind of in-group identity being eroded um, when we're talking about future threats uh, is going to be with us for some time because it's it's getting it's getting um, much more heightened uh, in the current in the contemporary world than than um, than I was expecting. Let's say. Uh, it's a great answer, and it actually um, goes a long way toward answering the first question we had from the chat which is how do far right movements in the West compare with other far right movements, such as the anti-Muslim rhetoric we've seen in India and China. So I think you touched upon that um, directly. And I think, you know, um, a, a good amount of that comes back to this propaganda around the demographic time bomb, right? Warning people that, um, you know, they are now shifting into this other reality where they no longer enjoy the rights um, of, of a majority. Um, and, and that is, it's quite damning for, for a lot of people. 
the, the, the next kind of common, sorry, and, and the kind of common thread between the kind of uh, golden age and the utopian future, you know, it, it, it's quite common throughout, regardless of these cases as well. So that's something to watch for. And, and in your in your sense, is there a lot of hyperbole that surrounds that, or a lot of kind of revisionist history pointing to um, a greater time that maybe wasn't that great to begin with? Yeah, I mean, I think it's all nationalist. All nationalist movements do they they pick and choose uh, from history the things that they want um, to be part of their movement right and so they kind of whitewash a lot of the nuance and a lot of the diversity and a lot of the uh, complexity that existed in the past for the sake of kind of making a very nationalist argument in the present and so this golden age of the past that probably didn't exist and and it's, it's supposed to set it, set you up for this utopian future that you're probably never going to get to <laughs> but um, it'll it animates a lot of activity a political and violent activity uh, in, in, in the contemporary world. It also strikes me as, you know, what you just described, um, it reminds me of what was going on in the Balkans, right, in the former Yugoslavia um, in the 1990s, right, a kind of uh, whitewashing of uh, papering over um, some of the positive aspects of living together in uh, multi-ethnic communities and only focusing on uh, the negative aspects and, and, you know, some, some politicians and, and military leaders reaching way back into the past to find examples uh, where they could, you know, sell to their supporters that uh, their, uh, you know, other ethnic groups were, in fact, the enemy. Uh, I'd like to move on. I have a, a question for, I, th I think, for Mary Beth. Uh, and someone from the audience asks, what are examples of effective methods to destigmatize former fighters? Um, as they are reintegrated back into their communities of origin. Great. So in terms of the methods, I don't, you know, with very few exceptions, I don't think any of them have been rigorously and empirically tested. So that's something where we need more research. But I can say what has been done in the DDR context. Um, and so some of some of the things that have been at least um, you know, shown at least qualitatively to be effective is preparing communities. So preparing communities that these individuals will, uh, will return, uh, either through messaging, through discussion groups, um, and also just spreading information within the community. So like take ISIS for an example, you know, just spreading information that, you know, not all of these individuals join willingly, some of them were coerced, explaining the motivations for their involvement, you know, they're not all horrible people, um, that those sorts of things can increase um, increase communal acceptance. Shared projects, which I mentioned earlier, um, are, you know, seem to be especially pivotal in doing that. Um, and individuals sometimes don't even need to reveal that they were a former member. Usually that happens over time, but um, it, it, you know, it embodies this commitment to a shared, a shared future um, and helps develop those, those pro-social relationships. Great. I, I'd like to stay on this topic because the next question, um, and it, it doesn't specify uh, exactly, but my, my sense is that this question maybe um, grew out of some of the information we know in the aftermath of the attack in Vienna. Uh, and, and the question is, for, for both of you, how do we better balance the need to protect the public uh, from those who've, quote unquote, faked their way through de-radicalization uh, and the need to reintegrate those who've truly given up extremist ideology? Amar, do you want to, we'll start with you and then we'll move to Mary Beth. Um, yeah, that's a very, very difficult question and kind of an ongoing policy debate, I think, for that, that links up to repatriation as well, um, is that are these people choosing to go through these programs or are they kind of mandated to go through these programs and, and, and what does that mean on the, on the other side? Um, I, I do think this goes back to um, something I wrote about a long time ago uh, on, on kind of the different kinds of people that are coming back, right? And I think Colin and I wrote a piece on this as well that not everybody is going to be trained and dispatched to come back uh, to the West to kind of launch attacks. There's going to be a kind of other cohort of people who um, I think we called uh, disengaged but not disillusioned, who are, you know, for a variety of reasons. The Atlantic uh, piece. Yeah, a variety of reasons disengaged from the movement, whether it's battle fatigue or they had a family or whatever it might be. But um, of all the ones that I've interviewed and in, in who've come back from Syria, um, if you ask them a question like, if there's another, you know, foreign fighter mobilization in a couple of years, uh, what would you do? And they'll say, I'll be on the next plane out, right? So they're still kind of attached to this broader social movement, um, but for a very particular reasons, um, they've been dis disengaged uh, from the current conflict. And so I think 
figuring out a way to disaggregate uh, and deal with uh, some of those questions might be an answer, but it, it is, um, I mean, it's an impossible question in many ways because you're, you're, it's like asking people to read minds, right? And, and I don't envy law enforcement and a lot of these NGOs who are working uh, on, in the prevention space and the, and the disengagement space that have to navigate um, people who are probably outright lying uh, in, or, in order to kind of just make it through the program uh, and, 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 uh, and, and then do whatever they have to do. But I, I, I think it's, um, it's an impossible question, but I think it, it's, it's one that uh, a lot of people are struggling with. Well, I think you've given us some good ways to, to at least kind of start piecing um, the, an answer together. Uh, Mary Beth? Yeah, sure. So I think um, sort of based on my own research, I think it's important to remember that for most people, de-radicalization is a very long process. Um, in my, you know, sort of in my experience, it's years, maybe even a decade. Um, so I think, you know, expecting someone to come out of a six month or a one year program completely de-radicalized is, you know, not going to be the norm. Um, so some individuals may, and I think it's also important to note that some individuals who are in that program um, may not be even radical to begin with, right? Maybe their involvement was motivated by friendship and they may spew the ideology, but they might not actually be motivated or believe in that, that ideology. So I think those are two important things to remember. So if we do have individuals, I mean, you'll never know if someone's faking, right? You can, you can say whatever you want. So there's no way to actually know whether someone is, you know, without, obviously there's certain intelligence methods you could use to, to see what else they're doing. But um, I think one of the things you can do is you, you just focus on promoting their disengagement, right? So promoting, you know, even if you have these ideas or you have these grievances, and I know some programs are doing this in Europe, how do you channel those nonviolently, right? So if you're upset about what Assad's doing to children in Syria, can you channel that into, um, you know, into protest activity, nonviolent protest? Um, so those are some of the things that I think you can do, and you can create these protective factors, right, through the development of those pro-social ties within the community, right, through employment, um, through social groups. And those pro-social ties serve as protective factors. And they also, you know, they change people's calculus in terms of the alternatives they have available to them. And then over time, over those years, they help erode the ideology. They, they change the ideology um, in, in a more organic way than the government having you, you know, sit down with an imam or something. I don't think that that's going to be um, pivotal. Um, and then the other thing I would say is that I do think that, you know, um, the programming has to be adequately resourced. So again, because it is this sort of long-term process, I think that individuals should be checked in on, um, you know, in terms of, you know, from a social safety net as well as a security net. And I think a lot of times these programs, you know, six months, one year, they're just, they're just very under-resourced. Um, you know, most of the money goes into sort of hard CT measures. If I can just add one more thing on that. I, I think- um, Please. Um, one thing to keep in mind is uh, how we define radicalization, right? Because I think what we expect, I think, at least from some of the social media conversations I've seen, is that if some of these guys come back, particularly the women, and they continue to wear the niqab, or the uh, men come back and continue to be kind of moderate Salafi in outlook, um, we still call them radicals, right? <laughs> and, and so there's this assumption that uh, to be truly safe, to be truly coded as de-radicalized, you have to become this like liberal Democrat who goes clubbing every weekend. And that's probably not gonna happen with a lot of these guys. They're going to come back and continue to be religious, continue to be uh, conservative uh, in, in a lot of their outlook. And so understanding, as Mary Beth said, you know, th they might be channeling a lot of their pro uh, uh, grievances in pro-social ways, um, but expecting them to look a certain way and act a certain way and, and coding that in your mind or interpreting that in your mind is what rad DRAD looks like um, is going to be a problem because they're not going to probably fit that mold that you're looking for. Um, and this was true from a lot of the women, uh, some of the women that I interviewed in Syria is they, they, they're not, ISIS in the camps wasn't telling them to wear a niqab, they're wearing the niqab because they're religious. And so what, when they come back to Toronto or wherever, um, people are going to look at them a little suspiciously. Oh, you joined ISIS and you're still wearing a niqab in Toronto. Um, how, you know, how are you still radical, et cetera? Um, and so that's gonna be, I think, a conversation we, we have to have uh, more honestly than we're having now is, is what are our kind of pre-existing assumptions about what de a de-radicalized person looks like? Um, and, and this is true in the white nationalist space too. I mean, some of the formers that I've interviewed in the, in the white nationalist space um, have just gone from kind of white supremacist to white civil rights, right? And, and they've just kind of taken a step down. They're not uh, out there preaching multiculturalism and diversity and pluralism. Uh, they've just taken it down a notch. 
Um, and so what does that mean, right? What is, that, what is that, are they still committed to the movement? Um, and, and so I think uh, it, these are difficult kind of transitions people are making. And as Maribeth says, they take uh, decades sometimes to work this out for themselves. Um, and, um, and some of these agencies and organizations that are trained to help them work it out are funded for a year or two. And so, uh, you know, after that funding runs out, these people are on their own. Then that also builds grievances as well, because they'll come back and say, like, you know, I've been abandoned, I'm unemployed. Um, and, and, um, and so this is a, I think having a much more mature conversation about what that looks like is important. But, sorry. No, I, I think what this kind of back and forth uh, has has reminded me of is really um, maybe we take for granted uh, the field of radicalization and de-radicalization. This is we're still in the nascent stages of attempting to understand these concepts, uh, even though there's great research out there. I mean, if you look at some of John Horgan's work, uh, J.M. Berger's work on extremism, um, I think we don't fully really. I think a lot of people don't um, understand differences between de-radicalization and disengagement, right? And um, Julie Chernoff's done great work on disengagement of Indonesian jihadists. So, uh, and, and then lastly, uh, in talking to scholars like Bart Skirman, who is uh, looking at why some people radicalize but actually never go on to commit acts of violence. Sometimes we treat those things synonymously, right? We say, this person is uh, radicalized and we assume that means that uh, they've either committed or intend to commit acts of terrorism. And that's not always the case. Um, I don't know what, what the data says, but I'll, I'll be curious to, um, to, to see Bart's work once that starts um, coming out. So there's a lot there, uh, I think, that we don't really understand, even though as scholars, we've been working on these issues for some time. Um, uh, and then what differences ex exist between um, jihadis what ex uh, and, and the far right um, or other forms of, of violent extremism. Uh, I, I want to ask about, uh, we've got a, a question in the, um, from the audience here that asks about, has psychology or behavioral science been at the apex of CVE programs? And I think, you know, from where I sit uh, for a while, the CV, CVE almost looked like a cottage industry, right? People were coming up with all sorts of cockamamie, you know, proposals. It seemed like there was a lot of money in the space. So you had people kind of coming out of the woodworks claiming to be experts. Uh, and then you had, you know, fairly ridiculous things like the Saudi art therapy program, um, you know, where you have these guys draw a couple of pictures of their feelings and um, are, are released back into society. And we wonder why those things don't work. Um, can, can you talk a little bit about the, the psychology and, and behavioral science uh, that goes into thinking about CVE programming? Uh, let's start with uh, Mary Beth and then we'll go to. Yeah, so again, just from my, you know, brief, brief knowledge working with with practitioners, um, my sense is that some of them, I mean, the ones who reach out are really interested in having an evidence based uh, approach to this. And so they are consulting psychologists and behavioral scientists, um, you know, to try and inform their, their policy and programming. But I think, I think you sort of hit the nail on the head, Colin, that there is a lot of CVE programming that is not informed um, by sound social science. It became kind of a cottage industry. And I think we saw a lot of development programming being uh, rebranded as CVE uh, just to secure funding. So, um, and I will say that those programs that do um, try to take a sound social science approach uh, and consult with academics and researchers uh, often what we would recommend to them is just not feasible financially. Um, so what I've seen is, you know, here's what we would recommend, but, you know, we don't have the money for, you know, two years of cognitive behavioral therapy for 64,000, you know, so, um, so there are clear limits um, on the financial capacity of, of governments or NGOs to implement some of these things. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't work in the CVE space that in, in, in that capacity, so I'm not uh, too sure. But I, I, from my inter interviews with uh, community members, I can say uh, something kind of what Mary Beth touched on is that I think the CVE framing, the securitization framing, does have massive impact and, and negatively in, in communities, right? And so even in Canada, we had uh, not so much anymore, but in the past, we had several instances where because of funding, if you were a after school mentorship program, or if you were just running a basketball camp, 
um, your funding was very likely to be cut. But if you reframed what you were doing as not just basketball for uh, you know disadvantaged youth, but basketball for uh, de-radicalization or basketball for prevention, um, all of a sudden the money came, right? And and what that did was it did two things. One, it turned a lot of everyday kind of community organizations into kind of uh, security organizations, right? The security oriented organizations. And that had a lot of impact on the youth that were coming as well, because now they weren't just playing basketball because they were children, but they were playing, playing basketball to make sure they weren't becoming a security threat. And that kind of was obvious to them. And that had an impact on how they saw themselves as kind of um, the, the state only cares about my well-being if I'm either troubled or troublesome, right? And, and, and so it wasn't that the state and everybody was concerned about me as a young person in their country, but it was more so um, how do we make sure that they don't do anything uh, from a security perspective? And so I think um, how we frame CVE in that way uh, can have a lot of um, second and third order consequences, I guess, if we want to go back to that term. Um, but, but almost by accident, if we're not if we're not careful. Great, yeah, I think a lot there um, that that I've observed as well. We are um, wrapping up on, on time, so I will save the easiest question for last. Um, and and if you guys could just give um, you know very brief thoughts here, uh, what in your in your mind is the biggest lesson that we've learned in the last twenty years of of you know Talk, having these conferences, working in this space, or maybe not the biggest lesson, but what would you want, um, if you could impart, you know, one concept with people as they leave this webinar today, as they leave this forum, what should they remember about violent extremism? Whether it's kind of correcting conventional wisdom, dispelling a myth, what's the high level takeaway? We'll start with Amar and then, and then Mary Beth. Sure. Um, I mean, the, the, the main thing I think that, is still a kind of common assumption is that um, these people, it's how we used to talk about criminals back in the 50s, right? That they're, uh, that they're kind of these unique individuals out there in the world. They have horns. If you can just kind of figure it out uh, or sequester them from society, everything will be fine. And I think um, not so much in the, scholarly, in the scholarly community, but in the public, I think that's still an ongoing assumption that, 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 that terrorists or radicals are of a particular sort. And I still get questions from uh, community members and journalists and others about uh, what is the kind of risk factors? What are the vulnerabilities? How can we, uh, how can we kind of pick out people who are vulnerable? And when you tell them, you know, there is no, you know, the, the usual talking point, there is no common pathway. There is no typical pathway. Everyone comes at this differently. Everyone has different push factors. Pull, uh, pull factors are also quite different. Um, at, uh, it's not a satisfying answer to most of these people. So they kind of often revert back to their stereotypes. And, um, and, and, and that I think is an ongoing challenge of, of a lot of academics who work in this field to um, have this conversation with the public. Because, I, because what, the, what the consequences of that is of course a lot of anti-Muslim policy, a lot of surveillance, a lot of interference in the community. Uh, a lot of um, monitoring of mosques, uh, which used to happen a lot in Canada and, and uh, that I know particularly well, because um, you would have a one individual from a mosque leave to go to Syria and law enforcement would come in and basically interview every single person in that community, um, and, and, uh, which was massively harmful and goes back to what Mary Beth was saying earlier is that when, if this individual comes back, um, we need that community to reintegrate this person. But what you've done as law enforcement by interviewing and securitizing the entire community is you've made them say, no, 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 keep him as far away as possible because we don't want that smoke, right? We don't want people knocking on our door. We don't want my kids monitored. We don't want our kids followed by law enforcement because they've made friends with this guy. Um, and so um, I think getting rid of some of those assumptions that these are somehow you know, crazy people, uh, but they're actually just one of us that, that uh, and, and tr treating them uh, in that way and understanding the policy questions in that way, I think um, is the biggest lesson, but it's also also not the lesson that's been learned. <laughs> so. very, very well said, uh, really well said. Mary Beth? Sure, um, I agree complete with, completely with Amar, but I will, I will add, um, I guess for me, it's that these tactical victories that we've had in the war on terrorism are, are short lived. So as I, going back to what I said earlier, if we fail to, to plan for what comes after, and I think 
where we see widespread violent extremism, um, you know, I'm not talking about, you know, the isolated Ted Kaczynski or where we just have, you know, smaller groups, um, but when, where we see widespread violent extremism and endemic violent extremism, I think we need to sort of step back from this focus, as Amar mentioned, on individuals, right? And, and it's not to absolve them of their, their wrongdoing, but say that, you know, th there's something wrong here, right? Th this is, um, there's a great article by Luigi Benante, um, all the way back to 19, I think it's 1979 in the Journal of Peace Research. And he says that terrorism is, is a symptom of a, a failing political system, right? There's something wrong in the equilibrium or the status quo in this political system um, that needs to be addressed. And so I think we need to think about violent extremism and terrorism as a political problem um, that requires political solutions. So um, there has been a clear shift to, to focus on um, military strategy. Uh, and less focus on uh, political strategy and diplomacy. And so I think that diplomacy is going to help us in the long run. Those are the things gonna, that are gonna help, you know, um, resolve the, the problems that are contributing to violent extremism. Well, I hope you're right. Um, and I would just like to take this opportunity to thank both of our panelists, uh, as well as our audience and everybody at Resolve for really what was a dynamic uh, forum. And I think, you know, I certainly took away um, quite a bit. I've got a couple of pages of notes here, um, and, and I hope you did too. So let me turn it back over to Alistair Reed, uh, and he'll, he'll close us out. Thank you very much, Colin, Mary Beth, and Mark, um, for a really engaging and fascinating discussion. I'm sure it'll give us um, plenty of food for thought in the coming days. And as I say, a big thank you to everyone who joined us today. We hope that you enjoyed the part one of the 2020 Resolve Network Global Forum series. And we'll be reaching out to you via email and Twitter with a quick follow-up survey. We really appreciate you taking the time to join us and for sharing your feedback with us. Please stay connected and check back for the upcoming events in the 2020 Resolve Forum series. Our next event will be co-hosted with the International Center for Counterterrorism, The Hague on December 1st, focusing on past, present and future trends in right-wing extremism, featuring Liz Pearson, J.M. Berger and Donald Holbrook. Thank you again to the U.S. Institute of Peace, to the Program on Violent Extremism, our partners in the U.S. government, and all members of the Resolve Network who make this event possible. Stay in touch on our website at resolvenet.org and our Twitter at ResolveNet, where you can find all of our publications and upcoming events. Thank you, everyone, and have a great day.